This is Tiger Cats post game on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. The Hamilton Tiger Cats are going to the Grey Cup for a second year in a row, and they'll get the chance to win the Grey Cup at home, try to be the first team to do it since the Saskatchewan Rough Riders did it back in 2013. Louis B. Andy Fan 2 is here on Tiger Cats post game, and uh, Andy, never in doubt was this one for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. <laughs> uh, it was definitely an interesting game, a tale of two halves for sure. Uh, but the Tiger Cats in the second half finding their offensive spark thanks to Dane Evans, Jalen Acklin, Don Jackson, and uh, defensively just did what they were called upon to do. An absolutely great effort on all sides of the football for the Tiger Cats to book their ticket to the Great Cup. Well said, buddy. It's not how you drew it up, but... You know, we're going to the show. Let's go. <laughs> oh. what, a, what a turnaround. Unbelievable. That Poppy White return just kind of sparked everything. And, uh, d you know, you look at Dane Evans, 16 for 16, 249 yards, two rushing touchdowns. Uh, what an unbelievable performance. And it seemed like it just there was a whole different mindset in that second half. And, uh and well deserved. Oh my goodness! I mean, it's, it's hard to believe. We right talked. We talked to. I mean, like you. You can talk about second half adjustments all you want. You can talk about making some changes. You can talk about the spark that Dane Evans gave to this team. Sixteen of sixteen, not throwing an incompletion, rushing for two touchdowns, and again, something Coach Salad mentioned on Tiger Cats pregame was they stuck to the run. And Don Jackson was able to put up a really big game, 95 yards on 16 carries. That's not going to fly under the radar in the locker room. And special teams, a fake field goal to get the first down on a Dane Evans run. Uh, a big Pappy White uh, touchdown return, as you mentioned. Yes, you know, uh, you know, you feel for Michael Damagald on the missed extra point, but a big two-point conversion for the Ticats on that second touchdown. And, and again... That first half, there's going to be a lot of things for the Ticats to take from that first half and think, how can we be better? There's going to be a lot of things at that second half that, that the Ticats are going to look at and be like, this worked to perfection. <laughs> yeah, there were so many points in this game where we're sitting here watching together thinking, we're saying, oh, okay, well, if the Ticats come back, you know, we're going to really have to put a lot of emphasis on Ja'Gara Davis and his and his two big sacks, his tackle for loss on the goal line, and, of course, that pass defend in the end zone against D.J. Foster, uh, looking like a cornerback out there. Yeah. Uh, and, and then and then it was, oh, Jeff Reinbull with the, the you know, the 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 fake field goal and the punt return touchdown. And then, of course, uh, just the, the whole team came alive on both sides of the ball in the second half. Uh, the offensive line was creating running gaps for Don Jackson. The play calling just seemed like it was just clicking. They were in a rhythm. Uh, they were just picking up first down after first down uh, where it seemed like they just couldn't find it in the first half. So what a big difference that the defense of the tackling was better. It was uh, just just a complete flip-flop between halves. And, I, yeah, I don't think there was any magic, like Bugs Bunny magic sauce or <laughs> Michael Jordan magic sauce or anything in the locker room. But, uh, you know, Coach said it at, at halftime. He said, we just got a play that wasn't us. And, uh, and, you know, they needed a spark, and they got it. And then the team responded. And here they are, off what, to the show. Whether it was going to be defensively, whether it was going to be big play offense, we knew that the Ticats needed something. Like you said, they needed that spark to get the ignition going. And in this case, it was a Pappy White return touchdown and a great special teams ta or a great double team tackle downfield. Nikola Kalinic came up big with, uh, you know, both on special teams and in uh, – in, uh, in on offense with a big 20-yard completion and move the chains as well. So a really all-around team effort when you look at this Ticats team, when you look at what they did with special teams tackles, like, you know, Kurt uh, Newton, two special teams tackles. You know, we mentioned Julian House here. He had a big game. J Jagarit Davis, that knockdown in the end zone, knockdown at the line, two sacks for 20 yards. Malik Carney coming up with a big sack. And then offensively, I mean, what more can we say about Dane Evans? This guy has been waiting patiently, you know, got in into the game, was able to beat this Argos team on Labor Day, then got hurt a few days later, and then really that was the last time we had kind of seen Dane Evans out there on the regular, but coach going to him early after a fumble from Jeremiah Masoli, and you know, I, I don't think there's going to be any second 
second uh, guessing that decision to go to Dane Evans. Speaking of Dane, we'll be joined by Dane coming up later on uh, in Tiger Cats post game. Of course, what's we'll, he feeling right oh, now? Oh man, my you know, he's I, <laughs> my my, uh, my over under on how many frickins he's going to drop will be about three or four. I think that uh, three and a half. I think I'll set the over under on how many frickins that uh, that I think Dane's going to drop in this uh, in this post game uh, interview we're going to have. But we'll name our performer of the game. No spoilers there. Uh, interview with Coach O, as mentioned, and we'll revisit Andy's car star keys to victory, and we'll have a post-game roundtable when Courtney Steven and Luke Tasker join us. But, I mean, defensively, offensively, special teams, coaches mentioned it all season long. You know, you got to win two out of the three. They won all three. They were the better team on all three sides of the football. You know, first half aside, they got the job done. And, and I guess, you know, how how did that translate onto the field? Like how how did we see two such very different Tie Cats teams from the first half to the second? Well, things that I that really stood out to me would be the defensive stops on the goal line in that first half were just incredible and, yeah. and completely tightening up after they were sort of bending all the way down the field uh, and even at the end of the game there on the on the second and ten, the second and ten and then they had to kick the field goal so. The, the stops on the defensive uh, back, backed up in your own end zone and then the coverage downfield defensively, like the one-on-one -on -one balls, uh, Siante Evans, Hyundai Adelike, uh, Jamal Roll, Carlel Brooks, like everybody was making plays in those 50-50 balls and that that to me was uh, stood out a lot. So that was incredible to see, challenging the receivers. And, you know, it seemed like the, the Argos were moving in at will in that first half. And DJ Foster was, was all over the field with running the ball, catching the ball. But they completely took him out of the game in the second half. And it, it was a big difference. Yeah, and, uh, you know... I you hate to see a guy like Des Lawrence go down, but, I mean, it, that's one of those benefits. And Coach had mentioned it last week when Siante Evans was unable to go. You know, we mentioned Stavros Katsantonis coming up with a big interception and a big play, and Coach had told us, he said, you know, what that told me was that the moment wasn't too big for him. It wasn't, uh, he wasn't put in a situation where, you know, the, 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 the situation, the, the playoff game, the being thrown in there wasn't going to be too much for him, and he came and was efficient again today, made his tackles, covered his men, and, and really made life difficult for McLeod Bethel Thompson. Uh, and again, this Ticats defense, it, it didn't really jump out the page as much as it did because the offense played a lot better than it did last week, but another solid performance. And if there's one thing this Ticats defense can do, that they've proven it's shutting down the run because for the second week in a row, holding a very good elite runner in this league to under 40 yards, DJ Foster finishing the game with 11 carries for 38 yards. So if you can keep a guy like DJ Foster under four yards a touch, you're going to have success. And I think the Ticats run defense is, is really the best in the league right now. It, that's a recipe for success. Shutting down the run defense, especially shutting down the run, especially in the playoffs. Uh, and, and it's going to be a challenge, whoever they play next as well. But that, that's, that's really been the, bit, you know, the, the bread and butter of this Ticats defense. And then today, uh, we, I already mentioned it, after you shut down the run, the team gets forced to be one-dimensional, throwing up, the, uh, up those contested balls. And the, the Ticats were, were right there to defend. They were aggressive. They weren't taking you know, dumb penalties, always looking back for the ball and making sure it was clean. And, and there were some, uh, there were some close ones, but they, they got the job done and just, just hats off to the whole defense as a whole to not give up a touchdown the entire game against a great Argo team. And again, something the Ticats did really well in that second half was they found their discipline. They got, you know, I don't know who got in their ear, you know, what Coach O was saying at the half. But, you know, the Ticats had seven penalties in the first <laughs> quarter. They had, or in the first half. And they have, uh, they had two penalties the rest of the way. So obviously the Ticats doing a fantastic job of staying out of trouble, you know, negating free yards to the uh, Toronto Argonauts. And, uh, and again, 27-19 the final. The Hamilton Ticats are going to the Grey Cup for a second year in a row. And Jalen Acklin caught all eight balls that were thrown his way for 112 yards and uh, including that 32 yard touchdown we were waiting for a game from a Ticats receiver like this all season long 
Just the second 100-yard receiving game for the Ticats this season. And Jalen Acklin could not have picked a better time to get this job done. We talked about who's going to be that wow factor, who's going to be the guy that has the will and cannot be denied, and it was Jalen today. He even had a couple that got called back. So his stat line was incredible. He was just making every play that was available to him. He was blocking out there for his fellow teammates. Uh, just, a, just a warrior, a competitor. Uh, amazing. Quite a, Quite admirable, I'd have to say. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, that's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite high praise coming from uh, uh, a guy who's uh, seen a thing or two uh, in the league, uh, you know, in your career. Uh, Jalen Acklin was great. Brandon Banks wasn't targeted much, but made the most of his three targets. Three catches for 63 yards, including a big 47-yard catch and run to get the Ticats in great field position. Tim White, again, wasn't, wasn't extremely busy. Three catches for 36 yards. But, again, give this give, give Dane Evans a lot of credit for to get it, moving that ball around. Nikola Klinich getting involved. Don Jackson getting involved out of the backfield. Like, it, it looked like for Dane Evans, who had played, you know, a total of what? Let's say 40 snaps under center for the Ticats over the two games previously that he appeared in. He looked like he hadn't missed a beat, you know, from the 2019 version we saw lead this team to the Grey Cup. He was sharp out there. He, he was also able to sort of scramble and make some plays. It looked like he was tied up in the backfield for a sack able to break break loose, extend the play, and find a receiver downfield. You know who else you got to give some credit to is, is really the play calling and Tommy Condell yeah. because in the first half, in that first quarter with with Jeremiah in there, it, you know, he was forced to take those check downs and, and he was under a lot of pressure. And then that uh, that one that, that he fumbled uh, in the scoring zone, you could see that there was nobody open downfield at all. So for Tommy to really mix up the play calling and getting some wide receiver screens, tight end screens like you mentioned, uh, just – just really keeping the defense on their heels and, and, and guessing and, ab and then able to go over top, find guys wide open down the middle, Jalen Acklin. Uh, it, it, that, you got to give him some credit for that too because the, the game plan really improved and, uh, and you could tell in the result. Yeah, the adjustments that uh, that to Coach uh, Tommy was able to make in this one, uh, you know, the, the the defense again was outstanding. You saw you saw Coach Washington out there after it looked like Tunde Adelike had made that interception to uh, to claim it uh, to to get the uh, the victory. Um, you know, it, it was a fantastic performance by the Ticats, really all three phases of the game. And uh, just running down some of the stats here as we uh, recap the Ticats 27-19 win. The Ticats finishing the game with 22 first downs. They were 9 of 18 on second down conversions. Anytime you can be 50% on uh, conversions, you're doing a great job. Uh, total offense for the Ticats, 353 yards on 56 plays. That's 6.3 yards per play rushing over 100 yards passing almost over 300 and again you know the tie cats ended up losing the turnover battle which we'll get to when we revisit your uh, three keys to the game but uh, really a tale of two halves for the tie cats after going down 12 to nothing at the half you know going back the rest of the way outscoring the toronto argonauts by a score of 27 to 7 in the second half so uh you know really when you look at the tie cats and when you look at going on to the Grey Cup. This is a team that's been here before. This is a team that's done this before. How is it how is it different? It's a different team, but how does this this you know, how does a you know a, a, a 15 and 3 team back in 2019 compared to this team going to the Grey Cup? Is this a little more special because of the way you had to do it? Well, one thing it, it, I'm almost, I'm almost a little more excited now because of what happened in 2019 where they seemed to steamroll the league and, and they really were the heavy favorites going in and everyone expected them to be there. And then they, uh, you know, what, you may all know what happened in the game. So this year, they've had to battle adversity. They've had to learn those tough lessons. Even, even as, as, most re more, as recent as today, they had to come back from a very bleak situation and, uh, and really turn it around and, and earn that win. So... You know, I, I, I look at this as a completely different year than, than last, than 2019, and have a lot of optimism going into next week in front of, you know, the in front of their home fans here at Tim Hortons Field. As if the Grey Cup wasn't already the hottest ticket in town. After that win, uh, just a few minutes ago at BMO Field, do you think uh, you think demand for tickets might be a little bit higher, knowing that the Ticats are actually locked in and will get the chance 
to be the first team since 2013 to, to play for the Great Cup at home? Oh, yeah, it's going to be incredible. We're looking at the forecast. It, it's supposed to be, you know, it you know, might change, but four degrees like, fair on next Sunday. Uh, it, we're watching this this Winnipeg game, and it's going to be like minus <laughs> 15 and snowing out there. So uh, definitely glad it's here in Hamilton this year, and it should be a... a, a you know, a fair game as far as not the weather not playing too big of a factor. But I, I, I do think it'll be sold out. It'll be rocking. I don't know how many tickets are left, but the answer is yes. The the phone will be off the hook for the uh, for the front office and the ticket sales. All right. Well, let's name our performer of the game presented by Hercules Tire right on our strength. And uh, I really don't think there's any question on this one uh, coming into the game. There were a lot of shining stars today, but there were. No, no, no brighter than Dane Evans. Coming in and sparking the team, 16 for 16, 249 yards, one touchdown, two rushing touchdowns, uh, just just fantastic, just fantastic. Uh, hats off to him and, and sparking and willing this team to victory. Could not be denied. Yeah, and, uh, and again, you know, Coach had mentioned it basically day one of training camp. Coach had mentioned it going into the season. He said, yes, we're going to have a competition. Yes, it's going to be a battle to see who the number one quarterback is. But at the same time, you know, it, it, we're going to need both. We're going to need both to the, get to the Grey Cup. I don't think they, they thought they were going to need all three with David Watford coming up big with a couple of wins in midseason. I know it's hard to look back, you know, to, to midseason, but David Watford played a huge role in getting the Ticats to where they were with the wins in Ottawa and, you know, almost coming back in Toronto. Like, this Ticats team had a plan. They used all three quarterbacks. They used 10 different offensive linemen to get the job done. So we'll get into all of that. But right now, exclusive access to the coaching room. Time to check in with Coach O, presented by Access Storage. And uh, Coach O, I guess the word quit is uh, is a word that is not in the Ticats vocabulary. No, we're not built that way. I couldn't be more proud of, uh, proud of everybody associated, all these players. Uh, they so deserve it. Coach, I love at halftime you just said, we, we just got to play. It's just, it's not us. And, and to have that kind of turnaround, you, you know, two years in a row, you're, you're only two years as head coach. You're in the great cup. You're in the show here in your home, home turf. Just how do you feel right now? Uh, I'll be honest with you, a little bit overwhelmed just because you want it so bad. They just work so hard. Like, I know every football team works hard, but, you know, obviously – I'm concerned with mine and just what you've been through. I'm just so proud of them. Uh, I feel excited. Um, but, again, the, the goal wasn't to uh, win the Eastern Division Championship. The goal is always to win the Grey Cup. But don't think for a minute we're not going to enjoy this one. Coach, you had said, you know, in the off season, you had said at training camp, regardless of who your starting quarterback was going to be, you were going to need both to make it to the Grey Cup. Uh, what did you see from Dane Evans today? Obviously a fantastic performance, but what did it mean to be able to to turn to Dane early on and for him to put a performance up like that? Well, we just needed a spark. And, uh, you know, again, this is why we brought both of the quarterbacks back. And, you know, you, you throw in David Watford for two wins. Like, everybody contributed. Uh, Dane today was exceptional. Um, you know, he didn't, didn't turn it over. And uh, just, you know, he would expect that of himself. We expect it of him. But when you do it on the biggest stage, I couldn't be more proud of him. Well, it certainly looks like a brilliant plan now. Uh, but the work is not finished. How, tell us a little bit of just about the vibe, the atmosphere there at BMO Field uh, with, with the Thai Cats and Tiger Town Nation invading the six. What was it like there? Uh, they, they showed up. Uh, it was... Uh, I'm not going to say it was unbelievable because I do believe it because, you know, they, they, they back it up. And they've done that since, you know, Andy, we had a great one at the Rogers Center in, in 2013. And uh, they said they were going to travel, and they did. They made a difference. There was a time there when our defense was on the field, and it was loud. And I thought, wow, I feel like I'm at Tim Hortons Field. Um, so this is such just a great win for the organization, the city of Hamilton. Couldn't be more happy, more proud. And I'm, you know, everybody's excited in the locker room. Absolutely. Not satisfied, but definitely excited, and, and I'm okay with that. Coach, there's uh, there's no negatives to this at all. Uh, maybe one is that you have to put up with another week's worth of questions from me. So uh, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let you enjoy this one, and, uh, and I'll put you on the hot seat back again on Tuesday. No problem. I'll take this over the alternative anytime. 
Awesome. Well done. Thanks, Coach. Congratulations. Thank you. That is the head coach of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, an exclusive access to the coaching room presented by Access Storage. And uh, I'll be honest, at, at 12 nothing, I was kind of looking at my schedule next week, and I thought, okay, well, you know, maybe a couple things open up. Maybe I can RSVP yes to a few more parties than I was planning on. And there was a little tiny part of me that was thinking, okay, well, you know, there, maybe there's a bright side, but no, no, no. What did I tell you? You told me You told me the game <laughs> wasn't over. And, uh, of course, lots to get to in terms of next week. But right now, very pleased to be joined by Dane Evans as we go down to the locker room and connect with Dane. This exclusive post-game interview presented by Axis Storage. And, uh, Dane, just try to put into words what that game, what, what you're feeling right now. Try to tell us. Oh, man, I can't. I can't. Uh... It, just a tremendous win for this city, for this team, for these guys. I mean, everybody went through something in 2020 with COVID and whatnot, and this season has been challenging too. We certainly had our ups and downs. And even this game, I mean, this game summed up the whole season and COVID, the whole everything. I mean, just super proud of these guys. We knew at halftime coming in that, you know, we might be down whatever we were, 12 or whatever, but we knew, like, no one – I'm not even like that's such a cliche line, but I'm not lying. That, no one had a long face. No one thought, oh man, we might be going home after this, you know. But uh, we knew we were going to win. It's just all about how, you know. And we executed in the second half, and we cleaned up the penalties and the turnovers, and, and we did it. Dane, ama amazing game, near near perfect. I mean, you always uh, you had a you had a QB room by committee this year, and how, how nice is it that you all were supporting each other and taking turns and and there was well, never any resentment and, and just to to be able to like go in and to provide that team with a spark and have that support by by Jeremiah and, and David Watford behind you yeah. like just how much more you know satisfying is it to do it as a group that's united like that that's the only way this works man I'm, I'm telling you I've been in a lot of quarterback rooms I know I'm still a young player but you know I'm a coach's kid so I've seen quarterback rooms since I was four years old basically and uh, that's the only way it works, man. And we really did the very first day of training camp when we all came in for our quarantine and stuff like that. Me and Jeremiah, we just we said it's going to take all of us, and we we didn't say it like, "Hey, man, it's going to take all of us." Type that we we meant it, and we looked each other in the eye. We knew that it really is. I mean, it, what what a story we're writing right now. It's not over yet. Um, it really doesn't matter who plays next week either. Uh, if, if the tie cats are on the field, we got a chance, and we know we all can lead us to victory, and we've all proven that. So we're and that's the only way it works is with the guys being such good guys they are. And, and that's really what it is. It's above being a football player that Jeremiah, Dave, and even Jalen on the practice squad, it, they're fantastic guys. And that's the only way this thing works. Dan, what did it mean to see the, the well-traveled Ticats fans who had made it to BMO Field? It was loud. You know, the Argos yes. were out on offense and it felt like a home game. Like, I mean, what did it mean to you to see how well the fans traveled to cheer you guys on to victory? Yeah, it meant everything because I know last time we came here a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, whenever it was, we had a chance to secure the East and we kind of let them down a little bit. So I was super like excited and just just beyond. I can't even put it into words when I saw how many still showed up this time with higher stakes on the line. And like you said, man, it, the Argo fans, I give them credit, man. They they were loud too. It was hard out there to communicate, but um, when like you said, when we were on defense, I mean, our fans were giving them hell and. Uh, it was it was awesome. There's a lot of black in the stands, so I'm excited to get back home and see some more of it. Dane, how critical were those goal line stands? That it where things were sort of looking bleak offensively and uh, and even defensively, a lot of chunk yardage. That that, but definitely a bend with a but not break sort of scenario and and holding them to field goals all game long. Uh, it com really comes back to make the difference in the game. So just talk a little bit Huge. about the defense in the yeah. first half. I, I can't say enough, man. They, I, I, like you, like I, like you said. I mean, they held the field goals, and obviously we weren't doing our thing in the first half. But they, that no one flinched on their side. No one was pointing fingers. Like, why can't the offense score or any of that stuff? So, the, the fact that they were able to bow up and buck up and and just stop them on the goal line and hold it to field goals. That, that I mean, that's the difference in the game. Honestly, um, we know our defense when they're out there that they're aggressive and they're gonna, they're going to take their shots. So their team's paid too. They'll make a couple plays, but. We know more times than not our guys are going to execute and hold them when they need to, and I'm so proud of those guys tonight. It was, a, it was honestly a complete team win tonight, and I'll give you a shout-out right now. Who sparked us off was Poppy White on the punt return, and every all 11 guys out there blocking for him, they did a fantastic job. It was executed perfect. 
and I'm so proud of Poppy. You know, Oklahoma boys, we got to stick together. So, <laughs> uh, Dane, I've uh, seen uh, Chef Tina throughout the stadium here, and she's passing us right now. And Chef Tina, is, are the Waffle Irons getting ready for tomorrow? Heat oh, those things up. Heat, heat those up. things up, Dane <laughs> says. So Chef Tina's going to have uh, some winning waffles for you here tomorrow at, uh, at <laughs> Tim awesome. Hortons Field. Dane, amazing yep. game. Uh, congratulations, buddy. Enjoy, enjoy it. And, and you're going back to the show. Enjoy. Yeah. Now we got to finish it. We've now been here before. Finish. we got to finish it. You're yeah. right. You're right. It's only begun. Thanks, guys. Well said. Thank you. That's Dane Evans, and he is our performer of the game, presented by Hercules Tire, right on our strength. 16 of 16, 249 yards, one touchdown. It's one thing to come off the bench and put up numbers like that, in a regular season game, in a, you know, in a week 15 game where the standings have already been determined, right? It's another to do it in a down by 12, lose and go home game. Like Dane Evans has yeah. ice in his veins to be able to go out there and put out the performance he did. Against a, an Argo defense that's playing like ultra physical. They're just crushing people. They're all over the field, sacking. And uh, to come in and totally flip the script, you look at those that stat line. You have to take a second take. It's it seems un, it seems unbelievable. Like no, that's not right, and, and it is. 16 for 16, two rushing touchdowns, one passing, t like just just incredible. And uh, but you know he's going to be the first one to who get, they'll enjoy it, they'll learn from it, like you said, and then it all it all goes back to basics, back to uh, back to ground zero for next week in the preparation because nothing translates to next week. All right, time to get to our post-game post post, post -game round table. Woo. 16th game of the year. Come on, I got this. Our post-game round table with Courtney Steven and Luke Tasker. And uh, Courtney, I want to start with you because really it was the special teams that got the spark going. It was the punt return. It was the fake, uh, fake field goal for the first down. I mean, Jeff Reinbold, they showed him on the sidelines. He was smiling. Take us into that, uh, that, 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 that special teams meeting room on Monday. There's going to be a lot of smiles to go around. Hey, I'm going to tell you this. Jeff Reinbold has been here before. This is a guy who's been around the league. He's seen every formation. He's seen every situation. He's got something for whatever is needed. And he went deep in that bag, called a great play. But you know what Jeff will tell you? It wasn't him. It was the players executing. And I think one of the things that showed up is late in the year, whoever has the best technique going upfield, inside, looking for that next block, getting a double on the kicker, the, holding the ball and just delivering it to the offense in field position, sometimes that ends up being points. And I think what we saw there between the touchdown run and that field goal where they went to the fake, rushed, got a first down, those two plays right there are very typical of Jeff coming in to save the game. It was awesome. The Argos knew something was happening, but couldn't stop it, even with Dane Evans. And uh, Luke, you you are the in the unique position as uh, you got to play with Dane Evans. You've caught passes from Dane Evans. Could you ever have imagined a performance like that coming off the bench, coming in cold, coming in down to go 16 of 16 for 250 yards and a touchdown? Well, I saw him do it in 2019, not quite to that magnitude of, of, you know, right off the bat taking over for 16 of 16, but he came in and very quickly in that season started playing at a very high level. And I mean, you just hear, you listen to the way that guy gets interviewed, like the positivity and just the, 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 the lack of any anything you could call selfishness just doesn't exist with a guy like Dane Evans. And so he is just, he, he's all team, he's all win, and and he, he loves, loves playing in moments like that. I mean, he loves the game and having fun doing it. Just awesome for him, awesome for the team and, and how they and how they pulled together uh, to, to turn that around. And I like how Dane said it, because yes, he was a big part of this, but Pappy White's return, that put the sales in the tie cats uh, momentum and you could and you could really feel things starting to go there yeah you could and i like how he he you know he started with poppy white he was the spark plug but uh he, he was the big the, the main spark but it was also the credit to everybody else around him on special teams and we talked before the game about limiting uh chandler worthy and his 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 factor on the game and it was uh an excellent job by all of Reinbold's teams today, the special forces today, that to get to get down there fundamentally and and cover, stay penalty free, and limit 
any type of spark uh, outside, like in the special teams game. So that you got to give a lot of credit to him. To that point for Reinbold, I'm not sure many people know this because it's not something that's uh, listed, you know, publicly or you know. It, it, but Jeff Reinbold does a lot of work with the running backs too. So this is one of those games where Jeff's going to look at what his special teams is able to do. Great downfield coverage. You know, that's one of those things that gets kind of lost, uh, Courtney, is that, you know, they really contained the coverage game for, for Toronto. That's something that's not going to show up, you know, in the stat sheet very big. But again, it, this is one of those games for Jeff Reinbold and for Tommy and for Mark Washington that, you know, the players played a great game. The coaches coached a great game, though, too. And, and you know what? Give credit where credit's due because uh, Chris Jones on that other sideline, Ryan Dinwiddie, they came with a great game plan. You know, the Ticats weren't yeah. coming out of the gates firing on all cylinders. Yeah. At the end of the first half, there's probably some Fairweather fans wondering what what's going to happen, you know. But I like I like how the Ticats, they, they just needed a spark. And once that spark was lit, it, it was a chain reaction, and you saw it pour over. The defense was flying around. The offense started to get things clicking, and, and those special teams plays transferred over. It's all about changing the field position and putting that offense in a position to deliver, right? So that's what they did. They, they set the table. Then you got guys like Jalen Acklin stepping up. You got guys like, you know, Don Jay stepping up. You got guys like Ja'Garrett Davis stepping up. He had oh. two sacks and two pass breakups. I mean, what position does this guy play? <laughs> it was amazing. That play in the end zone, though, How, Luke, to, to break it up. That? I mean, the all-hands team, right? I mean, Unbelievable. To, to be able to turn and, like, to have the knowledge to turn around, to be like, hey, I'm not going to get flagged on this because I'm going to look at the ball. I'm going to watch the ball come in. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, whether it was at the line, whether it was in the end zone, Ja'Garrett Davis was all over the field. It's not like he was just a big body standing in standing in the way. He was in trail technique. <laughs> like he, that that word doesn't even apply to his position. <laughs> and stuck a hand out there with his face mask to the quarterback. Like unbelievable, man. I wish he would have done his little like sack hip thing <laughs> after that pass breakup because that would have been sweet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you brought up Jalen Acklin Court, and uh, let's go to you, Luke, on this one because again, someone you played with alongside, someone you were in the meeting rooms, rooms with a lot back in 2019. He was a rookie. This looked like one of those games that we had been waiting for to see him all season long. Was targeted eight times, made eight catches for 112 yards and a touchdown. He was all over the field tonight, getting that yak yardage. I mean, great performance from him. Just unbelievable. Like, he, that's a guy who just really makes me proud. Andy, he's kind of like, uh, you know, he's like white lightning, third generation <laughs> kind of. You know, it was the torch went from Andy to myself to Jalen in many ways. And he, uh, though he's a little bit different, he's got some natural speed that, that sort of I had to fake sometimes. But he, <laughs> he, uh, like just great swagger and attitude i feel like that guy was ready to have a game like this all season but it just it just came his way tonight a lot uh you know he, he he's got he's got a smoothness and a route running ability and also just a real um you know playmaker's attitude and uh it, it seems to me like he's established some trust with the team with tommy and with the organization and uh really really just for a guy like that and for for me having been uh with him in his rookie year, I'm just proud to see him have a, have a great game like this. We just watched the the film of the 2013 uh, uh, semifinal where Andy Fantuz had a, had a, had an unbelievable game, and in years to come, this will be that for for Jalen Acklin and uh, the kind of game he had. Yeah, it was one of those games that like Jalen Acklin can look back on it and point out, and you know he was an All Star this year. Or he's an East Division All-Star this year. He's someone, and again, Speedy B was solid today. You know, wasn't targeted a lot, but made the most of his catches with 63 yards, but. You know, not looking past next week because you can't, because no matter who they're playing, it's going to be a tough test. But Dane Evans and Jalen Acklin could be that one two combo that this team's been looking for for a long time. No offense to the two men here beside me, but I mean, these are two guys who, who can really be a cornerstone of this uh, Ty Cats offense moving forward. And, and you know what? When you're preparing for the Ty Cats offense, there's so much to consider because. You know, Jeremiah, while he can move around, he's going to stay in that pocket a little bit more. And as he moves, he's going to look to throw downfield. Dane can straight up hurt you with his feet. And he will. And the thing is, first first play he gets in the game, or first series, I should say, they're rolling him out. They're moving the pocket. They've got a different set of plays 
for Dane Evans when he's in the game. So that's going to give those defensive coordinators coming from the West Division, it's going to give them a little bit extra homework to restudy and figure out how are we going to approach this? Do we want to try and keep him contained? Do we want to try and stop that run, bring some extra people into the box? Or are we going to try and go and really shut down all of these different receivers that they can give the ball to? Because everybody gets love in this offense. Yeah, I agree, Courtney. And th there was something different when Dane came into the game. You know, they were down 12 nothing, but a few plays here or there could have easily been 24 nothing. I mean, yeah. you know, it was, it was, it was, things had not gone well. And so they, just like we just heard Coach O say minutes ago, that they just needed a spark. They were looking for something different. It's not that Jeremiah had played terribly. They, they, they chose that moment to make it happen. But in the same way, Tommy Condell was just trying something different. You know, they were calling different kind of plays. They had that little, one of Dane's first plays, they rolled him to the right, and he sort of pitch, pitch passed it forward to, to Jalen Acklin. It just was sort of a different rhythm offense. And But Dane just kind of, Boy, he just ro rose to the occasion and took advantage of the opportunity he had. Yeah, I mean, there's really not much more to say. Dane Evans is going to his second straight Grey Cup. That's how we can phrase it. I mean, the Ticats are going to their second straight kick Grey Cup. And, I mean, this is probably going to fly under the radar, but Orlando Steinauer was a rookie head coach back in 2019. Now he's going, again, back to the Grey Cup. It, it, it is a really one of those... Uh, one of those positions where, you know, you, 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 you're, you're, it's on you if you lose. You, you don't really get the praise as much if you win. But I mean, what can we say about what Coach Steinauer has been able to do? Longtime coordinator in this league, but as a head coach, Courtney, what have you seen from him these last two seasons? Man, when I first came in this league back 2013, uh, that was my coordinator. And from that very beginning, I remember going into the Eastern final and just the way that he had – uh, a command of the room and it wasn't you know just a dominant commanding presence in that you do what you got to do because otherwise he's going to punish you it was a different kind of thing where you didn't want to let him down because you saw what he gave to the game this guy loves football and every aspect of him is his fiber of his being is all about this game he walks what he talks he's prepared for these big moments because you know, if you've been around Coach O, he's a checklist guy. He leaves no stone unturned, and that's the kind of attitude that trickles down to every player in that locker room. I think that's the results you're seeing is those habits and those things that he preaches is permeating the culture of this team, and I'm not surprised to see their success. I couldn't agree with you more, Courtney, and, and one of the things I love about Coach O the most is how it all starts with who you are as a person and who you are to your peers and to your family. and and. It really stems out from there. It's like how you live your life is how you're going to uh, be a football player. And in all those points you mentioned, it's just uh, just such a, a easy to like coach and easy to play for a coach. And just you know, the Ticats are fortunate to have someone like that. And I, the charge. I think the one word that has always come back when I've asked people about Coach Yo and I've asked them to try to describe, you know, who he is, what he does, genuine is the word that yeah. always comes back, is, is genuine. What you see is what you get when you get Coach O. And, and you know, that's is it, it's got to be easier to play for a guy who you know is not is not talking one out of his mouth on one side and doing something the other way. Like, what you see is what you get, I think, is the general consensus that we've gotten from Coach O. Yep, that is that is very true of him. And I think there's uh, – I think he's highly intelligent as well. In the football, X's knows, yeah, sure, so is every head coach in the CFL. But he's, he's on a personal level, on a social level. He understands people. He's very, very good. He's very relatable. And, and that's why guys buy in. That's why Courtney and I, as rookies in 2013, he, he was he's, even as a defensive coordinator when I was on the offensive side of the ball, he has just that special quality of a leader of men. He's just a... He's a guy who, who you can trust because you feel that he that he's competent and that he cares for the well-being of the team. So, boy, it has been uh, – this is the fourth Grey Cup, though, that, that he's been a part of uh, and they're without without a, a win. So for Coach O and for the guys in this locker room, very excited for what this uh, week uh, holds in store. Uh, just a quick update on what's going on out west. The uh, Winnipeg Blue Bombers – uh, had the ball in the scoring zone. Zach Caleros threw an interception to Ed Ganey, who uh, who had it in the end zone. And uh, Saskatchewan going three and out, and uh, Winnipeg back with the ball on the Saskatchewan now 10. 
Uh, so the, the the Blue Bombers working their way down the field trying to book their spot in the Grey Cup. Uh, just, just real quick on this game here because, you know, they're both good storylines either way. One, I mean, Zach Calero's coming back to Tim Hortons Field for the first time, you know, since he was a member of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders back in 2019 with the opportunity to win the Grey Cup. Saskatchewan rematch of 2013 when it was Saskatchewan, and I know I don't have to tell you guys about that game, but 2013 when it was Saskatchewan and Hamilton in Saskatchewan. Two really good storylines. What are you expecting to see uh, in this West, uh, West Final here the rest of the way? Well, it's going to be an uphill battle for the riders, that's for sure. you got a strong, strong bomber team. And uh, the one thing I look for from the riders' perspective is that defensive line needs to play to their best of their ability and they have a chance if they you know they they played well last week against calgary they need to play even better against the bombers because the bombers have four west all-stars on their offensive line uh, so the job just became that much harder against that bomber offensive line but to to have a chance in this one the, the riders defensive line has to has to uh, stand up it's it's cold it, you know both teams have strong defenses uh it, I, you know, I think both teams have a chance, but it's, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an uphill a, battle for Saskatchewan. For sure. It is interesting. The last home, the last team to, to have that opportunity of a home Grey Cup was, of course, the, the game that the three of us know quite well. Yes. And uh, the sea of green that we were swallowed by in that day was not pleasant. And But funny, you just the two players you just mentioned in that recap of the Western Final were both our formal, former uh, Ticat uh, teammates of ours, but... Uh, yeah, so interesting. So many storylines developing, but the the home the home Grey Cup for Hamilton that hasn't been here since the '90s. I mean, I was yeah. a six year old or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's really crazy. Four, I think. Not, yeah, four. Nine teams in the league, yeah. and, and, and I mean, it's just an unbelievable. Uh, drama that's developing. Uh, by the way, uh, Zach Caleros completed a pass to Wolitarski. It was caught on the Saskatchewan two yard line, but he was he fumbled it. Purifoy forced the fumble. It was recovered by Saskatchewan. So Saskatchewan <laughs> has the ball in their own, you know, shadow of the field goal. So that game available on TSN. Uh, let's revisit Andy's car star keys to victory. Uh, Andy, what'd you have for number one? Number one was shining stars. Uh, big makers, big plays, big players making big plays. And like, who is going to be that breakout wow factor, the guy who will not be denied. And uh, this, is a, this is a big thumbs up for me. Um, you know, you got... First and foremost, Dane Evans coming in to to not be denied. Jalen Acklin, uh, Garrett Davis, uh, Poppy White. Definitely a thumbs up on this one. And the, the stars showed up. Uh, so good job. And number two, what'd you have? Number, number two is passing accuracy downfield. So when you're in a situation where your your combined quarterbacks are 20 for 22, only two incompletions, period, uh, that's you got to give the thumbs up for that because there's you know the only the only two incompletions the whole time. There was not a ton of passes downfield. I was expecting more uh, downfield throws. There was only a couple that were more uh, 15 yard ish. I think I don't I didn't see any that were were, were further than that. Um, uh, so th hopefully they'll can open it up a bit more next week. But but still the accuracy was there. Uh, 22 20 for 22. Well, you know, that's a, that's a good point. They didn't really stretch the field, but if we remember the last time they played the Argos and we were saying that that wasn't really a great performance, they were doing a little too much stretching. So I feel like this is actually a really good adjustment specific to the opponent, but you're right. I'd like to see them get back to that tie cat, go down the field. I guess at the end of the day, what would Coach O say? You get the win, you're happy with the win, yeah. regardless of how it happens, but... <laughs> I you're, want to see some more fireworks. You're looking for one more point than your opponent, is, is, is Coach O's thing. Oh, I've heard that one before this season. Yeah. <laughs> is your bingo card full yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's full and then some. I'm on, like, my sixth bingo card at this point. I <laughs> uh, wrap up our Car Star Keys victory here. Uh, what they uh, what'd you have for this one, number three? Number three was win the turnover battle, and uh, they did not win that one. It was, it was two to one for the Argonauts. Um, it really, you can really cancel one of those out because it was a fumble and then another fumble all in the same play. Uh, and but the one fumble of the Hamilton was did cost them some points. Uh, well, I guess they both did, in a sense, because they yeah. were in the scoring zone. Um, so, un, you know, not too often that you win the game with losing the turnover turnover battle, especially in the playoffs. Uh, but so thumbs down on that one. 
how, how fitting is it, though, that the Argonauts lose with a positive turnover ratio when all season they oh. won with negative turnover ratio? Yeah. That, that will... They will forever be as the 2021 Argos are a statistical anomaly. Like, I right, put it in history. listen. I used a I used a word that I won't repeat on the air <laughs> on what the Argos were. It was it was akin it was akin to being fake. <laughs> I just thought the Argos season this year was a little bit. You know they 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 were negative points. Like they they Mind gave blowing. up they they gave up more points than they scored this season. They they won four games by a comp combined six points. Neg- like negative 17 turnover ratio. A negative set like there there are certain things about this Argos team that just makes me stop and th- again, I'm not here to, you know, uh, there's <laughs> whatever. I'm not going to go there. Um, gentlemen, it has been a lot of fun getting to broadcast with you guys all season long. Uh, Court, you and I have gotten to do some pre-games. Andy, of course, uh, we've been partners since day one. Uh, Luke, it's been uh, it's been really, really frustrating to watch someone with no broadcast experience do uh, what you do as well as you've done <laughs> well, it. Well, uh, with RJ Broadhead. He's, <laughs> oh, that's true. He's that's texting true. me that's, what to say during yeah, the game. So. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Uh, but all, all three of you guys have been lucky enough to, uh, to get to share uh, some of the airwaves with you. Uh, I'm not letting you guys off the hook. Gray Cup week. Uh, it's going to be you a know, blast. It's going to be a blast. Ton, tons going on. We're going we're gonna to keep it rolling. Ticat Audio Network will be in full force, both on the air and in person at in, all the events. In person, very much looking forward to, because the Ticats Audio Network will be your number one source for up-to-date and entertaining content throughout the Grey Cup Festival. Thanks to our great partners at Swoop Airlines. Listeners to those shows can win great cup tickets as well as round-trip flights to anywhere Swoop flies. And the more you listen, the more chances you have to enter. I don't know. I haven't heard from our boss, Dave Cadeau, about this. But uh, I assume I'm back with Thai Cats today, tomorrow. Like, I... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just got confirmation. And every Very day good. this week, oh, there Very you go. Good. So a double duty for Lou. Party uh, party at night, uh, working during the day, but wouldn't have it any other way. It's great cup. For it's great, great cup, cup week. Uh, well, one Hamilton team has gotten the job done today. Another trying to get it done in just a few short minutes is Forge FC getting set for their third straight Canadian Premier League title. They'll have to beat Pacific FC tonight, but it's a beautiful Winter night for football, the other kind here at uh, Tim Hortons Field, so should be a good one. And a couple of shout-outs before we go. First of all, to uh, Trey Ford, good Niagara Falls boy, uh, who became the uh, first black quarterback to win the Heck Creighton Award winner as the uh, U Sports top player. So congratulations to Trey Ford. And speaking of U Sports, we've gone the whole broadcast without me mentioning it, but congratulations to your Western Mustangs for winning the, uh, the Vanier Cup yesterday at Laval, uh, a big, big victory over the Saskatchewan Huskies. Yeah, congratulations to the Mustangs, Greg Marshall and, and company. Uh, fantastic job all year, well-deserved. Uh, it was a bit of a, a bit of a cold game there, a brisk <laughs> game, but, uh, and, and also Trey Ford. And, uh, you know, I want to, I'm looking forward to meeting Chuck Ely. Uh, he's heard him on the, on the broadcast with, the, with you before <laughs> and the Ticats free pregame today. And I was just reading his, reading my daughter his, his the do, the book that his daughter wrote, so about him, about his life. So I uh, hope, hopefully can get that signed next week when I see him in person. A near perfect Sunday. We'll see how Forge uh, finishes here today to see if it can do it. But uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, great work all season long. And uh, like I said, you're not going anywhere because uh, you'll be guests all week on my Tie Cats Day or whatever other shows we're doing throughout uh, Great Cup Festival. It's been a pleasure, Louie. And most of all, thanks to all the fans for listening. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. Oh, so yeah, I guess. Appreciate that. Hey, hey guys, guys, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. It's the Thai Cats 27, the Toronto Argonauts 19. The Thai Cats are going back to the Grey Cup, and it'll be here at Tim Hortons Field in one week's time. Thank you so much for listening all season long. Keep your ears locked in on the Thai Cats audio network throughout Grey Cup week. We'll have all the events covered to listen at listen.ticats.ca and on your favorite podcast app. On behalf of all of us here at the Thai Cats audio network, thank you for listening, and go Thai Cats.